Okay, so I think this is the uh, last session today. So thanks for thanks for holding out. I know it's been a long two days. Um, so what I'd like to do here is um, so I've done some uh, documentation for Libbycoin uh, in the past past half year, and as I work myself through over uh, you know up the repository, um, I've learned more and more about the APIs and. Um, it just gave me an opportunity to write some examples, hopefully, and provide a practical introduction to the Bitcoin as a developer tool, um, but also as I would argue a, a great a learning tool for people who are starting out in, in Bitcoin who, or who want to develop um, Bitcoin applications. Um, so Eric, Eric's actually here for for the session. So I think at the end of it, I can defer uh, some of the more more uh, detailed questions to him. Um, but yeah, hopefully to give you guys just an intuition of of what you can do with the Bitcoin starting out. So those are things I'd, I'd like to cover. Um, I'll give a brief overview over the toolkit over, overall. A quick comparison. Sometimes it's confusing, like what is Libbycoin really? Is it, is it a toolkit? Is it a library? Is it a server? Um, it's all of the above. So maybe we can do a quick comparison of, of, of the server versus uh, Bitcoin D that, that most of you are familiar with. Um, and then we have like the the BX, which is like a power tool, a command line power tool, which allows you to script scripts. Um, it's got hashing functions in there. It's got um, server query tools in there. Um, and also the, the, the base Libbycoin system library, which, which contains most of the consensus code in there. We've got the Libbycoin server, which is pretty cool. And we'll go over a very basic, maybe like your first Libbycoin learning app um, we'll go over one of the examples there. We can talk about scaling and, um, and the upcoming version that, that Eric and the maintainer team is working on. Okay. Uh, so quick intro, uh, currently maintained by Eric Voskel, um, initiated by, by Emery Taki, as you guys probably know, and uh, one of the first, or the first alternative implementation to, to um, the subject of your or Bitcoin D prototype. Um, one of the things that brought me to the Bitcoin is I, I'm not a great C++ uh, ninja, so the readability of, of the Bitcoin was was a was a great bonus for me. It's it's um, it's really the code the code standards are you know well maintained. It's 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 pretty readable for a C++ novice, and uh, there's just cert there's certain protocol logic that's just laid out there very nicely. So I, I highly recommend that for for people or students of Bitcoin. Um, there is a certain design philosophy around you know, performance on, on the server side, which is, which is pretty cool. We can go into it in a little more detail afterwards with a couple of examples. And uh, on that front, also scalability. I can also provide some examples there. So on the left side, you have all the, if you will, um, separate modules of the Bitcoin uh, laid out. And the, the arrows kind of you know, indicate the dependencies. Um, but the nice thing there is they all have their independent build system. So if you want to use a specific part of it, you, you can pull it out and, and do so. Um, the ones which are which are in blue. Um, let me start with the one at the bottom of the Bitcoin system. Uh, that's just a huge collection of, you know, uh, classes and methods that allow you to build everything from like wallets to light clients. That's all in there. And as we move up the left side, that's kind of like the client stack. We've got the Libbycoin Explorer. That's a command line tool that offers online functionality and also offline functionality. And so that's kind of the uh, you know great reference client implementation for Libbycoin. And on the right side, we have these kind of like the server stack, um, which ends up in a, a server performance server application. Okay, so coming from Bitcoin D, I've got three things kind of you know lined up here. I've got the Bitcoin D RPC, JSON RPC interface on the left. And we've got the Bitcoin server right thereafter. We've got the Bitcoin command line explorer in the um, second from right. And finally, we have the uh, Libbycoin system uh, kind of exposed to the right. So, so coming from Bitcoin D, you can kind of see how that maps over. Um, arguably, the the um, the chain function, chain subscription, chain query, those you'll find um, in Libbycoin server. For the other parts, like you know, block generation, PDP, the actual wallet app, um, Bitcoin doesn't actually have Libbycoin doesn't have a wallet app per se, but it does have. Uh, pretty pretty cool wallet functionality. We saw some of this stuff in the HD session yesterday. And so you'll find a lot of that either as a command line uh, 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 command, a BX command, or you find uh, the corresponding uh, class or methods in the, in the C++ library for you to use. Wow. I just noticed that you guys translated the detailed version. That's, that's awesome. 
Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of work. So, so for your reference later, you can get, you can you can probably find what you're looking for coming from the Bitcoin D side um, on on this uh, on this overview here. One thing to note is the interface that we use. So on on Bitcoin D, as James mentioned before, we have the um, uh, subscription stuff over the ZMQ sockets and the rest uh, via JSON RPC. Um, on the LeBitcoin side, we use um, ZMQ for both subscription and query. Uh, I will go into a couple of examples later, but just to just to highlight that. Okay, so one of the obvious things when you compare the server stack um, is is just the I guess maybe the design philosophy or it's just the the way you expose it to a to a public client. So if I'm running Bitcoin D, you know it's it's I, I, you can probably argue that's kind of designed like a you know like a, a comprehensive local app for 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 an end user. Uh, I've got a node in there. I, I can query the server. Uh, I can I have my own wallet. I can generate my own wallet from the Bitcoin D um, application. But um, if you want to expose it to let's say um, you know public clients, uh, you probably want to throw a RPC app in between that that adds authentication or or some kind of security that you you um, you want to pad it with. And so the Libicoin server itself uses the ZMQ um, socket framework for, for that, uh, which includes the curse CP security, I think it's 256 bit security. And um, we're gonna go through a couple examples there, but it's, it's a pretty nifty framework, which also provides great scalability. Um, one of the things about the ZMQ sockets, they're kind of like, uh, uh, they allow for, um, non-overlapping lifetimes of these sockets. So if you're doing like a distributed system where, where elements can come and go and you want good recoverability, that's a fantastic framework. So scalability is obviously one of the, security scalability is are, are one of the benefits for, for running a public uh, server like the Bitcoin server. Okay, so I have some examples. Um, the following examples are mostly around the command line tool and some basic Libitcoin system classes and methods. And you know, you guys got an intro yesterday on most of this stuff, but I think it, it might be valuable to, to see how that looks like in Libitcoin. Oops, sorry. Okay, so here's a quick one. Um, I, I do recommend if you guys are not too familiar with, with EC math to, to run this at home, but um, you know, Libitcoin has all the classes for for demonstrating the basic properties of um, of the EC math that you need in Bitcoin. Scalar operations over finite fields and EC operations. And so, for example, here we're, we're creating a seed, and we're uh, generating a, a secret from that seed. Uh, we can demonstrate distributivity over a scalar, right? So here we're doing the left side a plus b. Now we've calculated the left side. We are calculating a times C, which is part of the right side here of the equation. The second part, and as you add those up, you can you can demonstrate that yes, this and this equate to the same thing. Very basic stuff. And of course, also uh, operations over EC points. Same applies here. Distributivity, right? So A plus B times the generator point gives us this left side, the A point, and adding the A point to the B point gives us this, which we should be able to verify is the same. Yes, same point. Okay. So that's easy math. Um, the same you'll find in the C++ libraries. Um, so what I'm looking at next is you know a basic transaction build. This is an example where I'm spending um, a pay to pub key hash output to six uh, different outputs. And uh, so what I've done here is I've, I've, I've kind of stripped it everything, kind of like a bash program that you guys can follow. And all the commands you'll find here, so mnemonics, mnemonics of seed, uh, creating the keys here. This is the spending key that we're generating. And then here, these, this is the UT, uh, UTXO, that's a typo, UTXO that I, I can spend from. So those are test coins on there. And here I'm generating all the output keys with the HD uh, functions, HD key functions that um, BX provides. And here, I am building the output script. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. I'm calculating, this is pretty interesting. So I'm calculating the minimum fee 
that are, that, that, I'm, that, are, that is required for, for it to be accepted by the by the server. So you can you can have a closer look at this, uh, how the SIG ops are, are summed up, uh, SegWit and without SegWit. Okay, and here, here I'm constructing my, my transaction with the outputs. And then here with a very basic online command, I can fetch the previous output script that I'm spending. Oh, I hope I'm online. Okay. Um, yep, and then we sign it. So let me just double check I am online. Sorry about that. Yep, I'm online. Okay. We sign it and then we build the final transaction with the input script. And sorry. And then we can validate and broadcast. Let's see if that works. Yeah, the, the kernel might have frozen there, but but you guys can do that at home. Okay, so here's another one. So this is a pretty cool. You can um, you can use the eternal script machine from Libitcoin to kind of validate your scripts and really see this how the the scripts execute. And so the example here is a pay to witness transaction wrapped into a pay to script hash. Um, output script, and uh, so what happens is you have you basically have four individual script runs. Um, then the pay to script hash is recognized, and the embedded script is run, and then the witness script is recognized, and then the witness script is is basically run on on the uh, on the script machine. And so I think I should be ah, sorry the kernels all died on me. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm, I'm fetching the previous output script I'm trying to spend. I need that for validation, obviously. So here I've pasted my, my transaction, that's the Pay to witness script, pay to witness pub key hash, uh, wrapped in a pay to script hash script. And then when I run it, oh, fantastic, there we go. So when I run it, I can actually see the individual script runs, right? There's the operation that was, that was conducted, that's the, um, that's the operation right here. So basically a data push. And then here I have the stacked after that respective operation. And so you can kind of go through that, and if you have a, your own script that you want to debug, that's a fantastic tool to use. Okay. So on to the Libitcoin server. So as I mentioned before, the interface that we use um, is, is the ZMQ socket. There are, there are two different types. There's the ZMQ publisher, publisher socket, where, which you just connect to and you automatically receive um, updates. And we're talking about new blocks, new transactions, which are accepted um, either to the mempool or to the, to the inner block itself. And there's also a heartbeat you can subscribe to. And that's pretty nice because sometimes you might, uh, you might have, you might want to know um, whether the service is still alive at a higher frequency than let's say bro uh, blocks are broadcasted. So that provides you with that information. Um, in terms of the chain query, um, there's one thing I'd like to point out. Um, Libitcoin indexes also by, by address, and we're going to run an example where we use that. So you can, um, you can actually subscribe to notifications um, re regarding an address, whether something's being spent to it or whether it's um, spending a UTXO, uh, sorry, a, a, um, or whether a UTXO of an address is being spent. Um, let me see what else is there. Yep, that's about it. And so this is how, this is, so maybe some of you are pretty familiar with CMQ, but this is how um, a basic CMQ socket kind of, kind of works. So as I mentioned before, the lifetimes between the server and client sockets don't necessarily have to overlap. So all the connection stuff is abstracted away. So your application doesn't really see 
um, whether a, a you know an actual connection is happening. What you do is you you connect to a a, a port, you connect to your endpoint. Um, without really connecting, right? So, so right now, nothing's happened. You, you just told your socket, I would like to connect to that endpoint. I have yet to specify what message I'd like to send. Um, when you send the message, that message is then uh, put onto a, a queue, which is internal. That is invisible to the application. And that, that queue is then sent whenever the socket can establish a connection with the, with the server socket. So maybe your server socket is dead right now. You've sent something. Um, and once that server socket comes online, that message then is dequeued and then sent over the wire. Same goes for receive. So receive is a, in this case, a, a blocking um, command, but I can receive a message and I can dequeue it. And um, the way ZMQ messages kind of look like they have these little frames and uh, we have a, a format for Libbitcoin. Um, you have the command, server command, the message, message ID to be able to correlate the, the queries and it, we'll see in a second why that message ID is pretty useful. That is returned in the response. So if you send a message ID, you will get the response corresponding to the same uh, query ID. And of course, the query and respective response payload. And so here's, here's why that message ID um, is, is useful. Uh, you can connect to the server socket, which is a router, a ZMQ router socket on the Bitcoin side with either a requester or a dealer socket. So the requester socket um, is a little simpler to use. It is synchronous. So for every query, you get a response and uh, there's no, no other pattern that you can use. For the dealer, on the other hand, um, you can send as many queries as you want and they will be received asynchronously. Uh, the dealer also allows you to connect. Uh, I'll show you in a second. So here, here, are the pub, uh, here are the subscription services that Libbitcoin provides. So li the Libbitcoin server provides a heartbeat, new blocks exp um, uh, accepted to the strong chain, and new transactions, either in mempool or uh, included in a new block. So you just connect to that, uh, you connect to the publisher and you'll re receive um, updates automatically. The heartbeat, as I mentioned before, is pretty nice. If you don't receive an update, I don't know, in, in, in X seconds from the new blocks service, um, that's a nice way to know whether the, the server is still online. And of course, you can subscribe to multiple services with a single socket. In terms of security, um, so what you do is if you, there, the, socket, the, the, the server socket, for example, will have a public key that is known. And so you can authenticate that you're connecting to the server that you think you are. And you can generate your own private key and public key um, for every session if you want, or you can reuse that. And uh, that enables you to, to connect in a um, encrypted fashion. Conversely, the server can also host a list of um, uh, clients, client keys, client public keys, which are allowed to connect to the server itself. Okay, so I can show example there as well. So here's a simple example of connecting to the server and requesting the latest height of the strong chain. Here's the diagram of the CMQ socket we are using before. Um, we create a context, one context per process and thread. And we instantiate our ZMQ requester socket. So this is this is synchronous only. And right here, as I showed before, we we have the public key, the curve CP public key of the server that we're connecting to. And that way we can authenticate that we're actually connecting to the, the instance that we, we want to. And we're we're generating a new set of keys for, for our socket to derive the encrypted connection that we'll use later. So that's base 85 encoded, and uh, that's what we're using, using for this session. OK. So I'm connecting my socket to the endpoint. That doesn't mean I'm actually making a connection. That ha happens in the background. And here you see we're going we're gonna to send that request. This is the message format. That's the response format. Here's the request message. That's the command right there. Fetch last height. That's the message ID. Yep, and here we're setting up the response message objects right here. Um, and what's nice about using the same 
uh, you know, uh, base library as as a server side. For example, here we're we're dequeuing the response payload, and there there's some pretty nice stream methods that I'm using from Libicoin to dequeue the um, the error code and the the height encoded in four bytes. So let's see if that works. There we go. So the query went through success, and uh, we've we have returned block height um, down there from the test net. Okay. Okay, so finally, um, I'd like to give an example of what you can what you could build as a first project, for example, with with the Bitcoin. Um, uh, we're going to build a you know like a SVB light client, a wallet, and um, we're going to build one that queries the the um, public API of of the Lib Bitcoin, and we can do that because um, addresses are indexed, so I can actually um, receive notifications if an address that I control receives money, right? And I can build my Merkle proof. I can I can I can check and validate whether that was actually included in a in a block. So, what's what's an SPV client? So an SPV client basically validates the the header chain. It validates the proof of work, um, but does not actually um, validate the entire block itself. So in the Bitcoin, it would kind of look like this. I would have my headers. I would request those headers from a server. And there's this object called chain state, which is pretty nice. Um, the chain state takes every subsequent header um, and it kind of promotes its state to, to the next chain state. And, and one thing that it allows us to do is to understand, okay, so is the difficulty in that header actually correct, right? So the difficulty of that header at a certain height is implied by the, by the history of, of, of the header chain. And so that's kind of how we, we validate um, the header. We want to make sure that the proof of work conducted at every height is indeed valid, right? And that's that's all the that's all the uh, light client does. So I've got an example of that as well. Let's see if I can get that to run. Cool. So that's right here. And this is again all with the Libicoin system library. Very very basic. Okay. So I'm setting up my ZMQ socket. Setting up my Genesis block data. Yep. And what I'm doing right now is I'm requesting the header at every height, right? And every height, I take that header, I generate my new chain state at that height, and check whether the proof of work difficulty at that height was indeed done correctly. Okay, so you know it's just going through the entire chain right now, but what it's printing out is that every height you have. Let me stop it real quick. Um, it has the header hash, and it has the target difficulty right thereafter. And and at home or when you have time, when you when you let this run for a while, you see how the retard the difficulty retarget actually occurs, and you can you can visually observe how the headers are always uh, below the the difficulty uh, target difficulty that's that's printed out there. So that's all it does in terms of chain validation. Okay, so back to our SPV example. Now, if we if we want to then confirm um, that we've received money, right? We 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 haven't indexed any transactions. We've just validated the the chain, uh, the header chain. What we now need is some kind of information from the server that um, somebody has sent money or funds to to an address that we control, um, and we do that through subscribing to um, specific addresses in Libicoin. And as I mentioned before, because Libicoin server indexes by, by address as well, we can do that. We don't have to do this over the P2P uh, interface, public interface. Let me see if I can make this work. OK. So the way this works, so again, I'm making a query to the server. Um, but this time, I'm subscribing to a specific address, right? And so this is not a subscription in terms of ZFQ sockets. This is a uh, asynchronous um, query. So it's now telling me, okay, the subscription to that that address you want is confirmed, and I should be able to to send a transaction. 
and observe. Uh, this probably crashed. Okay, sorry, this, this kernel just crashed, so I'm gonna skip that, but you can ver verify that yourself. Just run this script, uh, send that helper transaction to this, to this address, and you will see that, um, you'll see that uh, you'll receive a notification that that address has actually received uh, some funds. Okay. So finally, now that we know that we've received a transaction, we need to verify that it's actually included into a block, that it has, has been confirmed. Um, and we do that through the, the Merkle proof. And so how do we do that? We basically request all the transaction hashes from that height of interest. And we, we validate the transaction that we're looking for um, is, is actually um, part of that Merkle construction. And then we can validate that that route is indeed uh, valid. So there too we have example, last example for today. Okay, let's see if I can get this nice. That's the transaction we're looking to, to validate. Next, we're requesting the Merkle root from the, the header chain. So we're fetching the block header at, at the height of interest. Then we get all the transaction hashes of that block because we need that to construct the, the Merkle block. And now we compute the Merkle root. So you can compare that root with the one we got from above, which is uh, here, and they are the same. So we just validated that that that, that transaction is, is, in, is in that block and is confirmed. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so now that we've built our first um, light client or, or Libbycoin application, uh, we can start thinking about how, how that scales out. So for the publishing service, what can happen? So on the left side, let's say you have multiple clients subscribing to your, um, uh, your, your publisher. What can happen is these messages can potentially be dropped if you have too many subscribers um, that queues up on the publisher side and they're, they're kind of dropped silently. Um, thankfully, ZMQ provides a really nice tool to, to provide a proxy. You just bind the uh, you know, a, a X sub socket type with X pub socket type and you can provide a proxy which allows you to scale out um, as you see on the right side. So that's, that's pretty straightforward for, for publishing services. For query services, um, let's have a look at uh, one without, like a brokerless uh, setup. So you've got some kind of load balancer that tells you, tells the client that comes online what the server side topology may look like. And then, then the question is like, how do you distribute the queries? And let's start with queries which are kind of stateless. So um, the query that we had before where we're subscribing to a specific address, there's a certain session state that's implied, right? I'm, the server knows that I'm, I'm, oh, I only want notifications pertinent to that address. Um, but other, other queries like fetch height or fetch block, those are obviously uh, stateless. They're not specific to, to that specific connection. So you can do round, round robin, you can, um, you can have the client distribute the load. And um, so if you want to provide some kind of scaling solution for um, you know, the, the address subscription we saw before, you can use a broker in between. And that broker kind of needs to track what, what server that subscription was, was requested from. So, because only that server instance knows um, what that client is uh, looking for, which address uh, is being watched. Uh, so that's it. So, Last slide is about version four. So Eric and the maintainer team, they're working really hard on, on making um, the initial sync much faster. And maybe Eric can talk a bit about that later. But basically providing, uh, you know, once you've established the strongest header, header chain, uh, the most proof of work, you start downloading the, the, the blocks in parallel, right? Not sequentially from the bottom. So you validate sequentially from the bottom, but you download them from the peers um, in, in parallel. Um, Neil's working on uh, the WebSocket interface. I believe HTTP and, and also uh, JSON RPC is, is part of that work. Um, so, so your front end or your browser will have an easier time querying the, the server directly. And there's also some work being done to parameterize the, the, um, the chain parameter so, so multi-coin support becomes a lot easier. 
So that's that. I hope I gave you a, a okay uh, introduction, or at least intuition for what you can do with Libbycoin and what it is. Server side stuff, entire toolkit, um, command line for for you know learning Bitcoin or, or scripting uh, transactions manually. Um, overall, a great a great toolkit. Cool. If you guys have any questions. Yep. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, there was a project called Dark Wallet. And um, apparently they were using the Obelisk server and that kind of got like merged into LibBitcoin because Amir Taki, you know, worked on that. And uh, I was just wondering, is that unmaintained? Because I noticed it was still in there and you could technically run a Dark, no, dark Wallet server using LibBitcoin server. Is it still maintained, or are you just kind of leaving it there like a little thing dangling off that you're not caring about? I think Eric can give you the history on how that was merged into the current project. Yeah, so the uh, the Bitcoin started out as, a, as several different tools for the um, support of the first dedicated exchange called Britcoin that Amir worked on with Phantom Circuit. And uh, so the, the what we call the base library, the system library, is basically still that, utilities you know, type system. There was Obelisk, which was also part of that, it just had a different brand. And there was another thing called SX. Never really figured out exactly what SX stood for. Sexy, Spasmilo, Expander, there's a couple of guesses. But um, they were all part of one project, which we call the Bitcoin. And so to prevent this kind of confusion, um, I eventually rebranded everything under just the Bitcoin. So that's why we got like 10 repos. One of them is the Bitcoin server. You saw BX, that's the Bitcoin Explorer. So if you drop the lib, it's Bitcoin Explorer, Bitcoin Server, Bitcoin Node. Those are the only ones that have executables and config and command line. Everything else is just libraries. Those sit on top of their own libraries, so you can make your own if you want different config, uh, which has come up recently. So um, yeah, it's always been part of the same set of stuff. Dark Wallet, different team, different project. Amir also worked on that. Um, Dark Market, same thing. That that was picked up by Open Bazaar. Um, there's other dark stuff going on out there, but uh, Dark Wallet has never been fully complete. There's a, another project that's kind of working on getting that complete now. Eric said it's end of the year. By the way, James is amazing. I would never have given you guys such a good presentation. <laughs> I'm so glad he took it. Um, but I have a lot more uh, history. So uh, V4, um, I've told people we're targeting at the end of the year. Uh, looks like we'll make that. The uh, biggest item is the first one. It's a little bit beyond just initial block download. Continuous parallel block download, is. it always works that way. So. Uh, a lot of parallelism and asynchrony and fastness, uh, parallel database writes, concurrent writes to the database of blocks, things like that. So it's, it's not just parallel block downloads, kind of a um, big chunk of work. But most of it's done and it's starting to starting to validate and uh, it's really cool. The WebSocket stuff is another uh, big chunk of work. What will probably happen if we don't get far enough along, it'll just be the WebSockets then maybe HTTP and then maybe the RPC compatibility layer for the stuff that we can support. We don't have a wallet, so we can't support all the JSON RPC calls that Bitcoin D does, but we, we don't intend to. The multi-coin support is basically done. Um, the Feathercoin Foundation put some guys behind that, and uh, so they're going to be in it. Uh, Litecoin, I think, is done. I think uh, Bitcoin Cash will be in there. Um, so basically, with configuration file changes only, you can run everything we already run. The wallet side, the, the BX side, and, and all the utilities, they already do. This is really just a question of um, expanding the configurability of parameters, constants that define node behavior.
Okay, I, I just wanted to point out, I want to thank uh, Andito and uh, Akio for translating all the slides. I noticed that that must have been an immense amount of work. Um, amazing detail, uh, attention to detail. So maybe just a round of applause for those guys. Thank you. Thank you.